All right, the dispensation we're about to launch on is called the Edenic Dispensation, or sometimes called the Dispensation of Innocence. Either one will work, take your pick. Last week we got into the recreation of the earth, and that's what Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 on is all about. It's not a creation, it's a recreation. In Genesis 1, it's an original creation. Something happened of, uh, of great cataclysmic proportions that put the earth without form and void, if you please, and we discovered that couldn't be anything but the fall of Satan himself. And so in the recreation, God says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to make man. And so in Genesis 1 and verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. All right, so man was created in God's image, which number one, as we noted in your notes, explains why man has two faculties that no animal ever has. Now, the evolutionists are doing everything that they can try to do to somehow tie you to the animal kingdom and convince our young people that their great, 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 great granddaddy was a monkey. I don't know why people even put up with that. I consider that a major insult. Uh, and uh, But uh, nonetheless, that's been going on for a long time now. But there's something a monkey can't do, never has been able to do, never will do. A monkey can't read, and he can't write. All right, now the ability to speak and read and write is what specifically differentiates mankind from the animal kingdom. Um, you know, and, and they come up with all this stuff. Oh, yeah, porpoises talk. Well, I never heard a por- porpoise quote the Declaration of Independence. I never heard of a porpoise quoting a Bible verse. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, chimpanzees, you know, they can communicate. Yeah, well, their communication is extremely level. So, when you stop and think about that, God breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. Now, it's the soul that differentiates the human race from the animal kingdom. You see, uh, man, as we're about to discover, is a trichotomy. He's body, soul, and spirit. Well, an animal has a spirit. You know, the uh, Ecclesiastes says, the spirit of the beast goeth downward. All right, so what's the spirit? The spirit is life itself. But an animal does not have a soul. He's, you know, so, you know, I, I know people get all strung out on their pets. And do you, you know, I've been asked four million times, do you think my doggie will be in heaven? No. Well, the hard answer is no. He ain't going to be there. Sorry, uh, you have a soul. The human, every human has a soul. Animals don't have a soul. So when you stop and think about it, if what differentiates us very specifically from the animal kingdom is the ability to read and write and the ability to reason that in, in, enables us to do those things is all captured within the framework of the human soul. Now, doesn't it make perfect sense then that God would reveal himself through a book? If we can read and write and reason enough to write and read, you see, doesn't it make sense that God, that you ask people, well, how, how does God reveal himself? Well, through my feelings. Boy, that's, that's a weak platform to stand on. You know Why? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it, Jeremiah said. Your heart will fool you. Your heart will lie to you. Your heart will deceive you. Your heart will tell you what your flesh wants to hear. You see, if, the, if uh, you know, the devil has the ability to manipulate the heart. So don't, don't always listen to your heart. Uh, people say, uh, well, I'm just going to follow my heart. Don't. Don't, you know, it might lead you into great trouble. I'm just going to follow. Don't, don't, don't do it. No, follow the reason based on the authority of God's holy word. Check out the book and see what it has to say. So that's what differentiates, you see. And so it makes perfect sense to me that God would reveal himself 
in the words of a book. Now, the image is further defined in Hebrews chapter 1 and Colossians 2 and 2 Corinthians 4, 4 as being none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the image. Uh, God created man in his own image. Well, what's the image? The image is the Lord Jesus. The image is a person. And Adam was so Christ-like before he fell that Jesus is called the second Adam. So furthermore, the image proves that Adam was a trichotomy. Body, you know what your body is? That's the dirt. We gave brief reference to this last Sunday morning. So your body is is the dust. The body goes back to the dust because in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, uh, Romans uh, 7, uh, 18 says. Well, the body of God is Jesus Christ. He's God manifest in the flesh. So he represents the body of God where Adam was made in the image of God. All right, the soul. The soul is the I am. I am that I am. And it corresponds to God the Father in type. And it constitutes part of the image which no man hath seen nor can see. Um, after the fall of man, this soul is stuck to the body. I know that's an important part that we need to grab hold of and not forget. Consequently, in your Old Testament, and I've given you several passages there, where the word soul is synonymous with the body. And so you can go to, uh, if you uh, study newspaper articles, and I've observed this for 40-odd, 50 years maybe, periodically where there's a great plane crash or a shipwreck or this or that, where a lot of people perish. And very frequently, right in the newspaper, they'll say, X amount of souls perished. Interesting phrase. All right, you know what even the newspapers have enough sense to do? They connect the soul to the real person. They leapfrog beyond the body. The real person isn't the body. The real person is something that lives with inside the body. And they acknowledge that. You go up to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and there's a memorial there uh, to all of the people that perished in the Titanic. And you'll see right there on the top of that memorial, all the names are listed, but it says the souls that perished on that memorial. All right, so that's an acknowledgement of the truth of God's word. God breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. Now, this would constitute an entire lesson that we're not going to pursue right now. But if you examine the soul in your Bible... The soul is the real you, and your soul is constituted of your heart. That's the seat of your emotions. Your mind, that's your intellect, and your will. That's where you make your choices, good or bad. Isn't life full of choices? Is there anybody here that wish you could go back and change one or two? No. <laughs> you know. You know, (laughs) so life is full of choices Um, and that's all housed within the framework of our soul. So the soul in the Old Testament is stuck to your body. As I indicated in, in, I I guess it was Sunday last, I I get lost where I was and when I was. But anyway, your soul is like an inner tube inside of a tire and that inner tube is stuck to the tire, which is the body. Now, the New Testament Christian experienced an operation in Colossians chapter 2 that freed the soul from the body. Hence, when you die, your soul is no longer held accountable for the sins of the body, the sins of the flesh. So it's free to go to heaven. That operation is called spiritual circumcision. And so God performed an operation on everybody that trusted Jesus Christ, the split second, the very moment that they asked the Lord to save them, and he took a very sharp instrument, and he cut your soul free from your body. You know what the instrument was? The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And then Peter comes along and says, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. I mean, all these things mesh wonderfully together. And then the spirit. All right. So God made man in his image. 
so the spirit, the body, the soul, and the spirit. Now, the spirit is like compared in your Bible to the wind. It's like air. So in our inner tube illustration, an unsaved person is a tire, but he's a flat tire. <laughs> and he goes down the road, flop, 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 flop. <laughs> and when he is saved, the spirit of God whoo, comes in and all of a sudden he can run down the road with purpose. You see? And, but if you run on a flat tire long enough, what happens? The tire goes to the junkyard. Amen. <laughs> That's the whole deal right there. So, uh, the spirit, the spirit is that part of you which, uh, now, now to differentiate and we must momentarily, there is the human spirit that constitutes life. The very fact that you can breathe air <sighs> means that you have a spirit. It's the spirit of life. But it's not the spirit of God. The, the spiritual spirit is dead in trespasses and sins. Until Jesus Christ saves you and then his Holy Spirit moves in and resurrects your spirit. And the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8.16 says. So there you have. So body, soul, and spirit. Now. A great mistake that is often made is people say, well, uh, you, know, in, you know, you even hear Christians say it. You hear the news media say it. Say it. You hear it all over the place. Well, God's made, uh, or man is made in the image of God. And so that retreat is based on the idea that God made me the way I am, and so therefore I have some justification or excuse to behave any way I want to. Wrong. Doesn't work that way. Because you weren't born in the image of God. You weren't made in the image of God. Adam was. You were made in the image of Adam. And so you got Adam's warts. <laughs> you know, that's what we all have. And so that's known to the theologians as depravity, total depravity they talk about. Basically, it's a sin nature. And uh, so man was, when he was created, of course, was put in a, in a garden that I'm sure exceeded anything that any of us could even imagine. It was a place of matchless delight. And as we indicated, amid scenes of indescribable loveliness with God as his counselor and angelic beings as visitors with a sinless nature and an environment most favorable to a pure and holy life, the progenitors of the human race were placed in a situation like that. The conditions were perfect. And do you know what mankind has been striving to achieve ever since that? To duplicate what he lost. So he says, well, we're going to duplicate it. And they come up with every kind of hairballed scheme that you can think of. So they build a big dome and call it, what do they call it, a biosphere? And we're going to live in there. And it's going to, we're going to create this wonderful, perfect environment. Or we're going to go to outer space in a space capsule. And we're going to inhabit Mars or the moon or somewhere else. And you know what they're really saying? They're saying this, we're going to try to escape this environment and create a better one. The problem is, wherever they go, they take their depravity with them. And consequently, you can go to Mars, Venus, Saturn, or Jupiter, and it's not going to be any better. As long as it's the human race that's inhabiting that thing. And so, <clears throat> the fall of man, well... We're going to talk about that a little bit more here. Now, but let's uh, major on the innocence a little bit. You know what God did for Adam? He made him a king. You know what a king is? A king is someone that has dominion over a certain area. You know, now, <clears throat> you know, some, some people, some men say, well, I'm the king of my mansion. God truly did make Adam a king 
and of his kingship, there can be absolutely no doubt for in the day of his creation, it was said that he was one who was crowned with glory and honor and set over the works of thy hands. And God put all things in subjection under his feet. You can pick that up in Hebrews chapter two. And so everything that was created in that recreation was something that God, uh, God gave Adam dominion over. In other words, Adam was the boss. He was calling the shots. It was his deal, his gig, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so this is his majesty, Adam the first. Now, like Satan, Adam was the son of God. Go with me to Luke in chapter 3. In Luke 3, we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ given that goes all the way back to Adam. Matthew only goes to Abraham. And so let's check it out here just a little bit. And so we're going through the whole genealogy, you see, going dating back to about verse 23 and through the rest of the chapter. And it's going from front to back, which was the son of Enos, verse 38, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Adam alone had that title, that parentage. Adam alone had that. And so uh, when we get back to Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son of his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Now, Seth was who, after whose image? Adam's image, not God's image, Adam's image. All right, it's a fallen, depraved, sinful image as opposed to Adam's creation, don't you see? What is being set up is the competition between two sons of God. So isn't it interesting that as you go through the book of Genesis, inevitably, it's one son against another. Jacob and Esau. And on and on it goes, right down to Joseph and his brothers. Joseph and his brothers. And uh, <clears throat> so you have good cop, bad cop. wonder where we ever came up with ideas like that. You know? You can't find... I'll challenge you. You can't find a piece of literature that's ever been written on this planet that has a plot. Now, there's a lot of junk out there that is plotless. You with me? But if it has a plot, I'll bet you anything I can show you that plot in the Bible. Because this is the root of it all, folks. Right here. It's in this book. All right? So something is being established, and we're going to find a competition between two sons of God, one that is a declared king and one that had lost a kingdom and is desperately trying to regain it. All right, so as king over the kingdom of God, Adam is a son of God, and he's made in God's image. So Adam is a spiritual king, Oh, in a spiritual kingdom as the son of God. Now, wait a minute. <clears throat> when we get to the New Testament, we encounter two kingdoms. We encounter the kingdom of heaven in the book of Matthew. And interestingly, Matthew is the only book in your entire Bible that uses that phrase, the kingdom of heaven. And there's reasons for that that we'll discover as we go on. And then when we get over in the book of John, what do we read about? Yea, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, it, it, you know, a lot of the theologues just want, uh, not wanting to do the work say, well, they're the same. They're not even spelled the same. They don't mean the same thing. God is not heaven and heaven is not God. Amen? Amen. And, you know, we got third grade kids in the Sunday school that know better than that. You could ask them that. They could tell you that. All right, so 
you have Adam who's a king over a spiritual kingdom in a sense that he's a son of God, but he's also a king over a physical kingdom called the kingdom of heaven. He's given a commission to replenish the earth, to subdue it, and have dominion over everything on it. Now, fascinatingly, and we'll get to that later, but I'll just throw it out now. After the earth is once again destroyed by water. Once again destroyed by water in the days of Noah. Noah is given the same commission. Replenish the earth. Hmm, you suppose that's a coincidence? All right, so now what is salvation as far as this uh, time of innocence, this uh, dispensation of, of innocence in the Garden of Eden? Well, salvation is defined in Romans 6, 23 as the gift of eternal life. That's what salvation is. You know, you someone can say, well, uh, you have salvation, but if that salvation is not accompanied by eternal life, it's not salvation. Amen? Amen. I mean, again, this isn't rocket science, folks. This just kind of sort of makes sense, I think. All right, so what did he have to do? What did he have to do to have eternal life? Well, he had to obey one commandment. That's all, just one. So obedience was required for Adam and Eve to have eternal life. And they had to abstain from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, according to Genesis 2.17. They had to abstain from that. And the other thing they had to do was accept a gift. They had to accept the gift of the tree of life. You see? So the Bible seems to make a complete circle. You know what's going on in Revelation chapter 22? Look over there. Last chapter in your Bible. Revelation 22. Revelation 22 and uh, verse... uh, Now, in Revelation 22... You're beyond the church age. You're beyond the tribulation. You're beyond the millennial 1,000 year reign of Christ. You're in eternity. We have eternity past and eternity future. And so way out there, you know, somewhere out there longer than we can imagine, in eternity, here's the deal. Verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Hmm. That sounds like Adam and Eve. They had to do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So this tree of life, very interesting. There's a tree of life in the garden. There's a tree of life in eternity future. Now you can't help but wonder, because the Bible seems to make a complete circle. Will God complete his plan? Well, what's God's plan? You remember what God's plan is? God's plan, according to Isaiah 45, 18, we looked at it, I think we did last week. God's plan is to inhabit the heavens and the earth. You know, in humanity, we really think we're a big deal. But we're, we're such small potatoes. I mean, we're, we're so minuscule in our ability to think and imagine and reason compared to God. God's got a plan. And the plan exceeds any expectation that any human could ever really fully realize. But that plan is to expand his kingdoms, both the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, because he told Isaiah, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. The thing is going to grow and grow and grow and grow. Now, I don't know how that's all going to shake out because there I venture into the world of speculation. And I usually keep it to myself because I just enjoy uh, fantasizing about it, you know. I think, uh, but but what I'm saying is the constellations and the galaxies beyond, you know, are without number. Nobody knows how many stars and planets are out there. They can't count them. They they can't figure all that out, you see. It's beyond anybody's ability to do that. And God's going to expand the thing and expand the thing. And uh, he's going to populate the heavens and the earth. All right, now, having said that, and we'll get more into that as we move on down the trail in later studies, let's get back to the garden. There's a tree. And God says, that tree right there, you can't mess with it. Okay. 
Now, here's a tree over here. That's the tree of life. And you can partake of that tree. Well, it can't ha- you can't help but notice that that tree has to be representative of a person. It's not just a tree. Go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus is speaking. He said, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Well, if Jesus is the true vine, and he is, then there must be a false vine. There must be a bad vine, a fake vine, fake news. Amen? Stop and think about it. For everything that's true, the devil presents something that isn't true to counterman the truth. It's always been that way. So Jesus said, I am the true vine. People say, well, what what kind of a tree do you suppose that was? A tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, I'll show you what I believe. And I can't run this out as absolute doctrine, but I think I'm, I, I think I got it. I think I got it. Go to Ezekiel in chapter 15. Ezekiel chapter 15. And uh, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree, or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Notice God is instructing Ezekiel, and he's calling the vine a tree. A tree is a tree. So he calls it a tree. And then he says, shall wood be taken thereof to do any work, or will men take a pen of it to hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it and the midst of it is burned. It is, is it meat for any work? Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat yet for any work when the fire hath devoured it and it is burned? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, As the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fuel for fire, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So here, twice, God calls the vine a tree. So people say, and you've seen cartoonists and all this stuff a million times, picture the tree of knowledge of good and evil as an apple tree. Amen? Amen. You got a big nasty green snake curled up in the top of it and you got Eve there down there and the snake is talking to Eve and all these apples are hanging out. The tree of knowledge of good and evil can't be an apple tree. You know what God says of uh, Israel? He says they're the apple of his eye. What we've established so far is the vine is a tree. All right. Now, And so in Ezekiel chapter 15, it becomes very clear that Certain vines have curses attached to them. Now, could it be, hang with me now for a minute. We're going to get a little deep here just momentarily. Could it be that the tree of life was also a vine tree? Jesus said, I am the true vine. There's a bad vine and a good vine. When I was a kid growing up, my dad would haul us up uh, to a little creek coming out of, uh, it's called Beaver Creek. There's a million Beaver Creeks in America. But this one uh, flows out of Skagway Reservoir up there by Victor. And we'd come in from the bottom side and fish in there. And, and, and back in those days, there was nobody around. It was good. It was real good. A lot of nice, big, fat brown trout, Bob. Uh, and... Um, Every year, every year we'd get in there all about late August, early September, and there were some wild grapevines growing over that creek. And they always looked so delicious. And every year I'd say to myself, I'll bet they're good this year. And I'd pick a handful and throw a couple of them in my mouth. And they're nasty. <laughs> They're bitter. They're sour. They're just not good at all. They're not good. But they look good. They look prosperous. 
They looked great. And so you just couldn't help but resist picking a little cluster and trying them. They were a wild grape, a wild vine, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 11. But conversely, if there were such, I don't remember any vineyards up in that part of the world, but if there was, there would be domestic grapes growing down there that would be good and tasty and fruitful and productive, you see. So there is the bad and there is the good. All right, now, what does the vine or the grape represent? What does it represent? Hang with me. Go to Genesis in chapter 40. Now, in Genesis chapter 40, Joseph is in prison. And two of his cellmates, as it were, is a butler and a baker that used to work for the pharaoh, and they disappointed him somehow, so they got thrown in the hooskow. And uh, so they both have a dream. And Joseph says, well, maybe I can interpret your dream for you. And verse 9, And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said unto him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches. And it was as though it budded. And her blossom shot forth. And the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Now, what came out of the cluster that was squeezed in the Pharaoh's cup, what would you call that? Could it possibly be fermented wine? No, it was fresh, right? It was fresh grape juice that's going into the cup. You follow me? All right, it came straight from the cluster into the cup. Now go to the book of Isaiah in chapter 65. All right, Isaiah 65, verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. All right, so we already identified it. Now we know for sure. Fresh squeezed grape juice is new wine. So you have two kinds of wine in your Bible. You have fermented wine and you have new wine, which is, uh, which is uh, fresh squeezed grape juice, you see. And uh, so, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servant's sake that I may not destroy them all. So there's some kind of a blessing attached to new wine. Hmm. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32, verse 14. Well, let's let's uh, let's back up just a little. This is a uh, the song of Moses, and in that song is a review of God's care over Israel in Exodus. And so he's running out some things that God did for them in the Exodus. Verse 13, he made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys and wheat. And thou didst, that means they did, they didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Now, wait a minute. The blood of the grape. So blood is connected in your Bible to the grape. Now the question is, is it the fermented grape or is it out of the cluster fresh? How are we going to know? Well, go to Deuteronomy 29. Back up a little bit. Verse 5. I've led you 40 years in the wilderness. Okay, verse 6. You've not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink. That you might know that I am the Lord your God. But wait a minute. In the previous chapter, we read that they drank the blood of the grape. But here we're instructed they didn't drink any strong drink. So that's pretty clear what they did drink, isn't it? All right, so fresh squeezed grape juice that comes out of the cluster is compared to blood. Now, let's fast forward just a little bit. Why do we use grape juice when we observe the Lord's Supper? Communion. 
because it's fresh squeezed grape juice that is identified as a picture of the blood, not that which is fermented. You see, it it, it doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the prophet said, Cursed is he that giveth strong drink to thy neighbor. Um, so don't, don't do that. Now, <laughs> having said all that, here's what's going on in the garden. Here's a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and it appears to be a grape tree, but that grape tree produces something that only gets people in trouble. Fermented. Amen. Amen. It gets people into trouble. You know, <clears throat> every drunken town knows one Bible verse. You know the verse. Take a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. So uh, every drunken town knows that verse probably. And so he utilizes that to try to justify his drunkenness. However, however, my first question to them, if they throw that at me, is how much is a little? All right. But now, here's the thing. You have one tree that represents the blood. They both represent the blood. But bad blood versus pure blood. Because the good tree, the tree of life, is wrapped up in a person because Jesus said, I am the true vine. And so right in the very beginning in the garden before man even fell, the the picture is there and it's there so quickly. You can choose bad blood and that's what Adam ended up with after he sinned. Or you can choose eternal God's blood. You know that God has blood. Well, Acts twenty twenty eight says he does. And that's what was shed. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was God. And so his blood was God's blood, don't you see? All right, let's go back very quickly. So why did God make heaven and earth? Well, he made them to be inhabited, as we've already discussed. Now, what I have down here, and I just quickly want to read through it, is a is a dialogue that you might very well have with a critic of the Bible. Because the critics come, and I've had encounters with them many times over the years, and they will like, if, if they really thought about it a while, they pursue a, a vein of logic at least similar to this, probably not quite as advanced with this as this, but nonetheless... Uh, So if God made man and he made everything out there, you know, the heaven and the earth, uh, why did he not make them perfect? That would be the pundit asking the question. Well, the answer is he did make them perfect. What we're dealing with in verses 3 through 28 is a recreation of a former creation. Even Satan was created perfect according to Ezekiel 28 and verse 15. And so he wasn't created as a serpent or a devil. He was created as a cherubim, an angelic creature, don't you see? Well, if God made them perfect, why are they not perfect now? Because something happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-3 to the physical creation, and something happened between Genesis 2-7 and 3-13 to the spiritual creation, the first man and woman. They fell in disobedience. If God is perfect and loves perfection, why did he not prevent this something from happening? And they think they got you right there. They think, you know, the barb is set in the fish's mouth. Well, the answer, first of all, because although the material creation was perfect, the man that God created was not perfect. He was sinless. But he wasn't perfect in his, in that he had the ability to sin. He was given a choice. Well, didn't God know the result of the test before it occurred? I mean, if he's perfect, he must have known. If he is really omnipotent, as you say he is, he must have known what would happen before it happened. Well, 
As, as a matter of fact, he did. He knew Adam would fall, and knowing this, he gave him the freedom of will and choice so he could or could not fall. And at that point, it's not in your notes, but at that point, I've said to people that are pursuing this vein of logic, I said, how would you appreciate it if you had no will to make choices? What would your life be like if you were an auto man or a robot and you just did as, uh, you know, somebody with a remote control told you where to go and what to do and where to eat and how to eat and blah, 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 blah. I said, you would have no real sense of appreciation for life. Well, they can't argue with that. There's no argument with that. So then it's not God, though, uh, indirectly or directly to blame for what took place at his creation at the start. And that's where Christians get squeamish. Christians don't want to blame God. Oh, no, I can't blame God. I can't say it's God's fault. But the answer is yes. The Lord could have prevented sin from entering, and he did not. Isaiah 47, God said that he created evil. God admitted to that. He declared that. So then is not God responsible for Adam's sin and the mess that man now finds himself in? Well, the answer is no. God does not tempt any man, neither can he be tempted. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and is enticed, according to James chapter 1. In other words, every person has a choice. Then who tempted Adam? Well, Eve did. (laughs) Well, who tempted Eve? The serpent. Well, who tempted the serpent if it wasn't God himself? Well, the answer is before the serpent was a serpent, he was not a serpent, but a cherubim. And he was drawn away of his own lust and enticed to put his own will above the will of God. And we have the passages there. So someone would say, well, get off that. If God is eternal and knew the end from the beginning, he would have prevented Lucifer from falling to the level of a serpent. Well, that may be true. God lets a lot of things fall in order to work out his original plan. Then God is only, then God is not only responsible for man's sin, but the serpent's also, since he allowed both to take place. Isn't that right? Well, the answer, if I say yes, what then? Then Darwin and Marx are right. There is no God because God is so imperfect that he is responsible for imperfection. Is not perfect. So if God is in any way responsible, this is the logic now, false logic. If God is in any way responsible for imperfection, then God himself can't be perfect. But wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. Suppose God remedied the entire thing and made right what was wrong. Has he not then cleared himself of all guilt and responsibility of the matter? Now the last paragraph, or the next paragraph I have here is I, I, I um, copied it from Dr. Ruckman. I'm not a plagiarizer. I gave him credit for it right down there at the bottom. Uh, And here's what he said. And he said it so succinctly and correctly that I just thought, I can't say it any better, so I'll just use what he said. And he said, if God is perfect, then love is one of his qualities. Now, what good liberal can argue with that? Because they're big on love, right? Yeah, so uh, love has to be one of his perfect qualities. For love to be really perfect love, there has to be two parties. One party loving the same party is not love. It's self-love, and it's not real love. You say, yeah, and you can go up to Barnes & Noble and any other bookstore in America and probably find 25 books on self-love. You know what the devil is encouraging you to do? Love yourself more than love God. All right, so... <clears throat> Uh, one party loving the same party is not love, for self-love is not real love. God, therefore, creates a second party, man. In Hebrews 2, 6, you get verification of that, on which to manifest this attribute. Now, if the man does not have a free will and a free choice, then he cannot return God's love. An auto man cannot love. The man must have a choice. And to have a choice, there must be a third party, the eternal triangle. And you've all heard that phrase. There it is, you see. In this case is a cherub who becomes a serpent. You can choose him or you can choose God. God allows this being, the cherub, to appear and tempt mankind so that the man can freely choose God as an object of love. Adam chooses his wife as an object and his wife chooses knowledge as do all good intellectuals. The man falls and God redeems the man by bearing the entire blame for both man and the cherub 
he does this sin, bearing by coming down and dying as a man. Having absolved himself of all guilt, it is now possible for the man to be confirmed sinless forever by receiving a sinless Savior as his own. The doc says, your move. (laughs) Now, it's really quite simple. God made man, but in that creation, he gave man the opportunity to exercise a free choice. God's love, which is real love, not fake love, false love, is constituted of a love that does not require people to love him because that wouldn't be love. Love is not required. It's not obligated. It's voluntary. Amen? Amen. All right, so Adam fell. Now stop and think about this as we conclude. Adam didn't have to fall. Because we get over in Timothy, Paul makes it real clear. Eve went into that thing and Paul says Eve was deceived. This The devil was so slick that he deceived her, he fooled her. But Adam was not deceived. He went into this thing with his eyes wide open. And he knew precisely what God had said. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But Adam partook of the forbidden fruit anyway, knowing that he would die. What's the lesson? Quite simple. Adam loved Eve so much that he was willing to die for her. And he did. And the second Adam, Jesus Christ, loved his bride so much that he was willing to die for her. And he did. You see how the type plays out? You see how the thing comes together? And then I know I mentioned this Sunday, but let me repeat it. God took Eve out of Adam's side, out of his rib. And so he had to perform surgery on her, on him. He opened him up and took a rib out and created Eve out of the rib. And so she came out of Adam. So beyond any possibility of coincidence, when Jesus was dying on the cross... A Roman soldier took a, stuck a spear into the side of Jesus and opened up his side so that Jesus' bride could come back in. Adam's wife came out. Jesus' bride comes in. And therefore we are declared to be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You can't get through the first three chapters of Genesis and for sure the first ten chapters of Genesis. I can show you every major doctrine of the Bible in the first ten chapters of Genesis. They're all there. What a platform. What a foundation stone. Now, do you suppose just a bunch of rummy dummy prophets wrote this book? <laughs> Do you suppose that way back yonder that they could have projected way down through the the future and anticipated what was going to happen and put all this together in this marvelous synchronized way and fashion? I, I don't think so. So Adam died spiritually immediately and physically in due time. His death was passed on to all of his children in that his children were born in his image and not God's image. He lost his spiritual crown, the kingdom of God, in that he lost God's image and his physical crown, the kingdom of heaven, in that his dominion was cursed. So as we go on, you know what we're going to discover? We're going to discover that God took the crown, the physical crown, and gave it to Noah. And he said to Noah, now you be fruitful and replenish. And so Noah had the crown of the kingdom of heaven. And what tripped Noah up? A vine. 
You with me? What did Noah do? He went out when he got off the boat and planted a vineyard. And as soon as he got a crop, he got smashed. <laughs> and it led him to all kinds of difficulties, you see. Isn't that, you know, it wasn't an apple tree that got Noah in trouble. It wasn't pomegranates. It wasn't almonds. Yeah. So, watch the grapes. <laughs> 